Thank you very much for the introduction and for inviting me to speak here. I'm very pleased to be able to do it. Um, so the plan of the talk is fairly conventional. So first there'll be an introduction and I'll state a new result for you. And then uh, quite a lot of the talk um, I want to spend discussing the proof. Uh, so most of the discussion will be pretty general and I hope quite accessible, more or less whatever your background. Uh, but there is a more technical bit as well, which if I have time, I'll say something about at the end. And then I'll finish off with a couple of remarks. Um, so to motivate this, I want to start off by talking about the Mermis function, which is something that many people know a lot about, but maybe not everybody. So the Mermis function is uh, a function of a uh, natural number n. It's really important in analytic number theory. And uh, this is the definition. So uh, if n is divisible by any um, squares of primes, uh, then mu of n is just zero. And uh, if not, so if n doesn't have any repeated prime factors, then mu of n is uh, minus one or one, depending on the parity of the number of prime factors. Uh, so for example, mu of one uh, and mu of six are both one, because uh, one has zero prime factors and six has two prime factors, which are both distinct. Uh, mu of two and mu of three and mu of five, and more generally mu of any prime is uh, minus one. And uh, mu of four is zero because four is divisible by uh, two squared. And uh, a key property of this function, which is kind of uh, resonant with the title of my talk, and this is the most important thing for today, is that the Mobius function is multiplicative. Uh, and that means that uh, mu of n times m is mu of n times mu of m, uh, provided n and m are coprime. And uh, if you want to check this, the coprimality of n and m just means that the uh, no repeated prime factors condition splits up into a separate condition for n and for m because the prime factors of n and m don't sort of interfere with each other. And then if you have the square freeness condition, the no repeated prime factors condition, then the parity just splits up as the parity of n and the parity of m. Um, okay, and why is this so important? Well, here is a, a little hint uh, about why. So um, if the real part of s is bigger than one, if s is some complex number, you can form this Dirichlet series whose coefficients are the Mobius function. And this converges absolutely and defines a holomorphic function uh, on this range. And if you multiply this by the Riemann zeta function, zeta of s, and see what you get, um, on this range of s, the zeta function is given by uh, an absolutely convergent product, an Euler product, which is this. So product over all primes p, one minus one over p to the s to the power minus one. And uh, on this range, this Dirichlet series with coefficients uh, Merbius is also given by an Euler product where the term is one minus one over p to the s. And uh, if you want, if you're already bored with what I'm saying, you can try and uh, prove this by just formally expanding out the products and collecting the terms. And the minus one here corresponds to the minus one to the omega of n in the definition of u. And if you look at this, clearly every term in this product cancels with the corresponding term in that one. So this is all just one. So at least when the real part of S is bigger than one, uh, zeta times this Dirichlet series is always one. So that says that uh, small values or zeros of zeta function sort of correspond uh, to large values or to poles of this Dirichlet series with coefficient u. So that's a bit of a hint at why this Mervis function is interesting. And I'll uh, come back to that uh, a bit later. Okay, so uh, in the 40s, uh, Wintner, who was maybe the first person uh, ever to look at random multiplicative functions, uh, what he wanted to do is to construct a random model for this function, the Mobius function. Uh, so he wanted to find a random real sequence or a random real valued function that mimics some of the properties of the Mobius function. So I want to explain what his construction was. Um, so he took uh, on the primes, just an uh, independent sequence of uh, coin tosses. So an independent sequence of plus or minus ones with probability half each. And these are called Radomaka random variables sometimes, these kinds of plus or minus one random variables. And then he extended this function to a function of all the natural numbers in the following way. So uh, if n is not square free, if n has any repeated prime factors, he just set f of n to be zero. And uh, if not, if n is square free, so all the prime factors of n are different, then he set f of n just to be the product of f of p for all primes p dividing it. And this random object is called a Radomacher random multiplicative function because it's constructed from these underlying Radomacher random variables. And uh, if you think about how this behaves, 
Uh, well, we do have multiplicativity. We have f of ngm is f of ng f of m, provided ngm are co-prime, just like for the Möbius function. Because uh, once again, the square freeness condition, if ngm are co-prime, just splits up as a separate square freeness condition for ng and for m. And if they are co-prime, then the prime factorizations just concatenate here. So you get this, this report. Um, clearly, f of n and mu of n are both zero if n has uh, non-trivial square factors, just by, by definition. And uh, on the square free n, uh, f of n takes values plus or minus one, and so does mu. So uh, f mimics these properties of Mervius. Now, um, you can wonder whether this is a really good model for the Mervius function or not. Um, in my opinion, it's not such a great model for certain questions, um, but uh, is the model that Winkner wanted to consider. Uh, I want to mention a variant of this as well. So as well as the Mobius function, there are other very interesting number theoretic functions that are multiplicative. So there are functions like uh, n to the minus i t, to some fixed t viewed as a function of n, uh, or the complex Dirichlet they count as chi of n, for people who know what they are. So these are functions that are very important for studying the distribution of things in arithmetic progressions. And to model things like this, we use uh, Steinhaus random multiplicative functions, which are a variant of the previous definition. Um, so this is how it works. So now uh, on the primes, you take the values f of p to be independent, but uniform on the unit circle in the complex plane, instead of being plus or minus ones. And this kind of sequence is called a Steinhaus uh, sequence sometimes, Steinhaus random variables. And then we make these into multiplicative function just by setting f of n to be the product of f of p to the power a, where p to the a is the highest power of p that divides a. So if n has prime factorization, p to the a1, p1 to the a1 times p2 to the a2 through to pw to the aw, then f of n is f of p1 to the power a1 times f of p2 to the power a2 and so on. So here we don't worry about the square freeness. And you can check that in this case, uh, f of m n is equal to f of m f of n actually for all m and n without the uh, copromality description, uh, just like for n to the minus i p or for chi of n. Um, now, the, the key thing to note about both of these, especially if you're from maybe a more probabilistic background and not so interested in the number theory motivation, is that uh, these values f of n, uh, they're not independent random variables. Um, so some of them are, on the, on the primes they are by construction, but if you look at the whole sequence f of n, uh, they're definitely not. For example, uh, f of six just by construction in both of these cases is f of two times f of three. So if you know f of two and you know f of three, then you completely know f of six. So they can't possibly be independent. Um, and this means that the, the classical probabilistic techniques don't transfer at least directly to study these random multiplicative functions f of n, and that's what makes them challenging and, and interesting to study. Um, so maybe this would be a good point to ask, if anybody has any questions about the definitions, please ask now because you won't understand much else of what I, I say if this isn't clear. Okay, so um, let me continue. So uh, for the Möbius function, uh, it's conjectured that you should have a lot of cancellation in the partial sums. So this uh, sum here could in theory have size order x because mu takes values plus or minus one, and zero. But it's conjectured that it should be a lot smaller than that. It's conjectured this should be bounded by a constant times x to the half plus epsilon for any fixed epsilon. And uh, this is actually equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis, uh, this bound. Uh, so this kind of manifests what I hinted at earlier, that if you know uh, that sums of Möbius or the corresponding Dirichlet series don't get too big, that tells you that you can't have zeros of a zeta function in, in bad cases. Um, so we expect a lot of cancellation in this sum, but we also expect it should be very hard to, to prove because it's equivalent to our range. So uh, what Winkner was interested in doing is proving bounds for his, his random model of Model object is random multiplicative function to try to get an idea of what might be going on uh, for Möbius. And the kind of bands he wanted were almost sure bands. So that means bands that hold a probability one. And uh, let me just uh, emphasize, so something that holds with probability one, it doesn't mean it necessarily always occurs. So there are events that can happen, but they happen with probability zero. 
but something that holds with probability one, that would seem to give a reasonable kind of indication of what might be, be going on. And what he particularly had in mind was this uh, classical result, uh, the law of iterative logarithm. So this says that if you have a sequence of plus or minus one coin tosses, which are just completely independent, so a very classical probabilistic setup, and uh, you look at the partial sums, then almost surely, so with probability one over all these kinds of sequences, uh, the lim sup will look like uh, square root 2x log log x when x gets big, and the lim inf will look like uh, minus square root 2x log log x. So uh, almost surely these partial sums will get as big as root 2x log log x in from your form, and they'll get to minus root 2x log log x in the negative direction, but they won't get bigger. So this is a very precise statement about the uh, almost sure fluctuations of these sums. And what he was interested in is having something like this in this uh, more arithmetic situation in this random multiplicative model. And let me just emphasize here, so if I fix an x and I look at the sum of the epsilon n by the central limit theorem, this has a roughly Gaussian distribution. So for fixed x, this is roughly Gaussian with mean zero and variance x, which is the number of terms. And we expect something like that to be of size like root x, roughly, like the standard deviation. But the, the growth you get here is bigger. This is root x log log x. So when you take the lim sup, when you look at all the values of x simultaneously, you get larger fluctuations than if you just fix one point. And that makes sense. But that's kind of the heart of, of the result to understand the effect of looking at all these x simultaneously. Um, so as I said, what he wanted is something like this in the random multiplicative case. Um, so let me give a kind of a potted history of what's known about this. Um, so these are all in the, in the Rademacher case, the first case I explained, which you can think of throughout the talk if you want. Uh, and these are all almost sure bands. So these hold with probability uh, one. So Winkler himself proved that the uh, sum uh, is big O of x to the half plus epsilon and is not big O of x to the half minus epsilon. Uh, so it is bounded by x to the half plus epsilon, almost surely. And it does fluctuate at least as big as x to the half minus epsilon infinitely often. Um, so this is like the equivalent of the Riemann hypothesis for this uh, random object, almost surely. Uh, this was improved by Erdős in some uh, unpublished work. So he got to uh, root x times a positive power of log for the upper bound, and root x times a negative power of log for the lower bound. Um, and then uh, there's a, a really um, beautiful seminal paper of Holash in this area from the uh, 80s where he improved this again. So he got to uh, something roughly like root x e to the root log log x in the upper bound, this extra factor that I won't try to say because I'll make a, a mouthful of it, and uh, root x e to the minus root log log x in the lower bound. So uh, just to, to be very clear here, so, so log x is e to the log log x. Right, so the improvement here is this is e to the root log log x. So the improvement is the square root in the uh, exponent here. And uh, there are lots of nice new ideas in, in this paper. So for the upper bound, uh, he uses conditioning and he uh, applies um, moment bounds just to the randomness from the large primes. And this connects with um, some nice issues in, in homework analysis actually with some hypercontractive inequalities. And the lower bound, he makes a connection with um, large values of the order products. So he can produce large values of these sums if he can produce large values of the corresponding random order product. And then he creates just by hand a very clever argument for doing that. And that's where this uh, comes from. Uh, and then most recently, uh, the upper bound was improved to big O root x log log x uh, squared, roughly, by uh, Pascal and Lao Teng and Baum and Wu. Um, not really independently, they sort of they knew what each other were doing. Um, and uh, this is by um, improving the um, treatment of the moment in Hollash's upper bound. So they introduce a splitting device that makes the moment calculations more efficient. And that's where this improvement comes from. And uh, I proved that the sum is uh, almost surely not big O of root x divided by log log x to the 5 over 2. And this is by uh, improving the estimation of this random order product in Holash's lower bound. So instead of using uh, the very clever ad hoc argument that he did, I introduced some tools from uh, Gaussian process theory to do this, which gives a, a sharper result. Um, now, the thing to notice about all these bounds is that uh, the lower bounds are all smaller than root x. 
Okay, none of them grow fast in the root X or even as fast as root X. And that's, that seems like quite a weird situation to a number theorist, I would say. So we don't usually expect to be seeing consistently smaller than square root fluctuations. Um, but it's not clear that it, it might not be happening in this case. So um, Holash asked whether it might be true that these sums are bigger of root X almost surely. And um, on the other hand, Erdős conjectured that that shouldn't happen, conjectured that almost surely the sum should not be bigger of root X. Um, I've just mentioned that this was in the Steinhaus case and this was in the Rademacher case to be fair to what they actually said, but I don't think we expect really any difference between these. Um, so there's no reason to think that looking at Steinhaus or Rademacher should change the, the behavior in this respect. And uh, Erdős also said in this uh, same paper that uh, so far as he knew, nobody had a plausible guess for what the real size of uh, this should be. Um, so the result I want to talk about today um, resolves this issue, um, to an extent at least. So um, this is the, the new theorem. So um, for both Steinhaus or Rademacher random multiple functions, uh, if B of X is anything that tends to infinity, however slowly, then uh, almost surely, so with uh, probability one, there'll be uh, large values of X where uh, the sums are bigger than root X times log log X to the one quarter divided by V of X. So in particular, you could take V of X here to be log log X to the power 0 0.001, let's say. And then the right-hand side, it would be growing uh, appreciably faster than square root X. And the theorem says that almost surely you'll get fluctuations that big uh, infinitely often. So uh, this shows that um, the asked Holash's question is no, and uh, Erdős's conjecture is true. And um, regarding this bit, nobody has a plausible guess. Well, I still wouldn't claim to have a plausible guess for the exact order of um, magnitude, but uh, it is plausible that the exponent one quarter in this bound might be sharp. And I'll explain at the end of the talk why that might be. Um, so what I want to do now, unless there are any questions at this point, is start talking about the proof. Okay, um, so uh, what happens here is that um, we sort of give up on the, the basic strategy of proof that Holash introduced in his paper, and we go back to try to produce these large fluctuations to a more classical probabilistic strategy like you might apply to the uh, classical law of iterator algorithm, which I'll remind you of here. So what I want to do is try to explain in reasonable amount of detail how you prove uh, the existence of these large fluctuations in this law of iterator algorithm. And I'll do that in a way that uh, certainly isn't new, but if you've seen just kind of one proof of the law of iterator algorithm before, or no proofs, then the proof I explained probably won't be the one you've seen before. And once I've explained that, we'll try and see how this can maybe transfer over to the random multiple situation. Um, okay. So um, I claim that to prove um, the existence of large fluctuations, the lower bound part, if you like, of the uh, classical law of iterator algorithm, it will suffice to prove that the uh, maximum of these, these sums, when I renormalize by one over root x, is bigger than about root two log log x with probability uh, tending to one as x goes to infinity. So let me just remind you, the epsilon m's here were just independent, completely independent, plus or minus one random signs. And uh, obviously don't worry about exactly what this, this interval is, just some reasonably big interval of x. Um, so why will it suffice to do this? Well, uh, if this holds, then the probability the maximum is smaller than about root two log log x will be little o of one, would be just the complement of this. And if that's true, then I can select a sequence of X values, a sufficiently sparse sequence of X values, so that these little O ones look like, let's say, the reciprocal of the squares along this sequence of X values. And then if I add up these probabilities, these, these probabilities of the opposite of this event, so these failure probabilities, uh, it will converge along this special sparse sequence of X values, where the little O one terms are looking like the reciprocal of the squares. And then it's a, a kind of basic and actually quite easy to prove probabilistic fact, the first Raoul Cantelli lemma, that if you have a sequence of events whose probabilities converge, 
then with probability one, only finitely many of those events can occur. And if only finitely many of these failure events occur, that the uh, thing is less than or equal to root two log log x, that means that from some point onwards, this event is always occurring. So with probability one, for some point onwards along our sparse sequence of x, this maximum will be bigger than this. And that says that one of these sums is bigger than root two x log log x, if you move the root x to the other side. And that's what we want. Um, so this is different from the proof you might have seen of the uh, law of iterated algorithm, because here I'm only using the first Borel Cantelli lemma. So the usual proof uses the second Borel Cantelli lemma. And that has a good thing about it, which is that you don't need bounds here that hold with probability close to one. You just need bounds that hold with sufficiently positive probability, let me say it like that. Um, but the bad thing about the second Borel Cantelli lemma is that it requires independence of the events that you're working with. And that will not transfer at all well to the random multiplicative space. So what we've done here is we've moved some of the difficulty about. So we're only using the first Borel Cantelli lemma, which doesn't require any independence assumptions. But we now need to get this kind of band with probability very close to one. And what I want to explain is how we can do that. First of all, in this classical uh, setting, and then how it transfers over to the, the multiplicative. Um, OK, so uh, I already remarked that um, these uh, partial sums have roughly Gaussian distributions by the central limit theorem. So when I've renormalized by 1 over root x, this will now have a roughly standard normal distribution. So a Gaussian with mean 0 and variance 1. And we understand very well how a single standard normal distribution behaves. And what we need to understand to prove law of iterated logarithm is the interaction between all these sums for different x because, um, let me just go back. So here we have a maximum over x. So we need to understand the effect of taking this maximum on the behavior of, of these objects. And whenever I give one of these probabilistic number theory type of talks, what I try to emphasize about Gaussians is that Gaussians are great because to understand their dependence, you just need to compute their correlations or their covariances, which isn't true for general random variables. So, we know that the means are zero, the variance is one. What's the covariance, which is the same as the correlation if the means are zero and the variance is a, a one. So the covariance is just the expectation of uh, the product of, of this thing at two different points, x and y. And you can easily compute what this is. So the, the square root x and the square root y come out, there they are. And then when you take the expectation of the two sums, because of the independence of the epsilon n's, the only terms that, that survive are the ones up to the minimum of x and y. So this is uh, exactly what the, the covariance is. And you can see that this is bounded by one always, which is good because that's, that's the variance. And if we look at this for the uh, special points, uh, x and y being powers of some uh, lambda, then uh, if x and y are different, uh, the biggest of x and y must be at least lambda times as big as the smallest. So that means that the, the denominator here, the x, y, is at least lambda times as big as the numerator. So when you take the square root, the denominator is at least square root lambda times as big as the numerator. So if you look at this special kind of sequence of points, if x and y are different, you can say that this covariance is bounded by one over root lambda. And uh, so if the covariance is close to one, if it were exactly equal to one, that'd be saying that these random variables were very dependent, were essentially the same random variable. But if the covariance is getting smaller, that's saying that they're becoming more and more independent. For Gaussians, this is true. This certainly isn't true for general random variables. Um, OK, oh, we need to fit all these points into this interval that we had here to start with. So how many of those points can we get in this interval? Well, basically, it's the log of this endpoint divided by log lambda minus the log of the other endpoint divided by log lambda. So it's some constant multiple of log x, roughly, divided by log lambda. OK. And then um, for Gaussians, as I said, um, everything works, works great because you can understand all kinds of statistics of Gaussians if you understand their covariances. So if I have some uh, standard normal random variables, g1 up to gn, and I know that their uh, covariances, their correlations are bounded by rho, so some fixed rho between 0 and 1, let's say, then with probability very close to 1, 
the maximum will be bigger than about square root two, uh, one minus rho log n. So if rho was zero, this would correspond to these Gaussians being independent. And it's quite well known that the maximum of n independent Gaussians is roughly square root two log n, with high probability. And this is the generalization of that to the case where there is some, some non-trivial correlation. And uh, this is actually very easy, relatively easy, let me say, to prove. People who know about this, uh, this follows very easily from Slepian's lemma, whatever that is. Um, OK, so if we go back to the set in here, so we have a bound 1 over root lambda for the non-trivial covariances. So rho is going to be 1 over root lambda. And uh, this is our number of, of Gaussians. So, here, so here's n. So if you plug this in um, up here, you get uh, a lower bound with high probability, 1 plus the low 1 square root uh, 2, uh, 1 minus uh, 1 over root lambda. And then log of this is still roughly log log x. Inside. There's a little bit of dependence on lambda from the denominator, which I've just proved a little low one. Um, um, Okay, and lambda here can be can be anything, arbitrarily large but fixed. So if I take lambda big enough, I can get this to be as close to square root two log log x as I want. And that proves the, the lower bound bit of um, Kinchin's law of iterative logarithm. Um, so let me emphasize that um, I've really shown you basically a complete proof here. Um, I didn't um, I didn't give a precise statement of the form of the central limit theorem that you'd want to apply here. Now, I didn't prove this for you, but you could certainly do both of those things uh, rigorously. So th this is really a full proof on these uh, three slides. And what was absolutely crucial here is that we're working with Gaussian random variables. So that meant that to understand the size of the maximum, we just needed to understand these correlations. Okay, so um, can this be made to work then for uh, random multiplicative functions? Um, well, there, there aren't any, any prizes for guessing that just by the anthropic principle, the answer is yes, because if the answer were no, I wouldn't have bothered to spend some time explaining that. Um, but there are some um, significant problems to address. And the main one is that um, unlike in the classical case, um, these sums where f of n is a random multiplicative function uh, do not have Gaussian distributions. So that's that's not obvious. That was kind of open for a while whether that would be true or not. But we now know that they definitely don't. And actually, if you uh, renormalize the sum in this way by root x, then this will converge to zero in probability. So I proved um, a few years ago, but published uh, earlier this year, that actually uh, this sum renormalized like this usually has size like uh, one of the log log x to the one quarter. So it's getting small when uh, x gets large. Certainly not roughly uh, standard. Um, but nevertheless, let's let's just proceed and see what we can make to work. Um, so just like before, it will suffice to prove that the um, these uh, maxima of these sums are bigger than log log x to the one quarter over v of x with probability tending to one. Um, so now we don't have root two log log x here because we're not shooting for that. We have log log x to the one quarter over v of x, like in the statement of the theorem for the random multiplicative functions. And uh, I claim that it will actually suffice to prove something like this uh, just for a bit of the sum. So just for the part of the sum where the numbers have a pretty big prime factor, a prime factor bigger than uh, capital X. Uh, so the real part here you can, you can forget about, really. So if we're in the Radomacher case, everything is real anyway. So this real part doesn't make any difference. Uh, in the Steinhaus case, taking the real parts just makes things simpler. But you don't have to worry about that for the purpose of, of this talk. Um, OK, so why will it suffice to handle just these subsums? Well, uh, if, this, if this bit of a sum is big, if we have a band like this for this part, the only way that the full sum won't also be big is if the other part of the sum, the part where the numbers only have smaller prime factors, were also very big at the same point little x and sort of cancelled out with this bit of the sum. And we expect that for any given little x, it should be quite rare to have a large value of either piece of the sum. So to have a large value of both of them simultaneously should be even rarer, should be really rare. So if we can produce a large value of this, it should be very difficult for the other bit of the sum to cancel that. So that's a heuristic reason why it's enough to handle this. And actually, the way we set this up, it's quite easy to show that proving this is, is enough. 
And what's good about this bit of the sum is that uh, these numbers, so they, they have a prime factor, which is bigger than capital X, but they can't have two because they're not large enough to have two prime factors that big. So these numbers, they look like some big prime between capital X and capital X, the four thirds, times some uh, smaller number M. And then since F is multiplicative, uh, F of N, which is F of M times P, just splits up as F of P times F of M. So this is a rewriting of the sum, which is there. Okay, and uh, so what, what was the point of doing this? Well, um, now, so if I, if I condition on these inner sums, so that means if I kind of freeze the randomness of these inner sums, so because uh, P is big, X over P is small, so these only depend on the uh, F of P's for the small primes P. So if I, if I freeze these, then this sum, it looks like some kind of coefficient, which is now fixed, it's frozen, it's conditioned on, times these independent random variables F of P. And the sum of independent random variables F of P times some coefficients is the kind of thing that we might expect to have Gaussian. Um, so what I, want, what I want to really emphasize here is that um, this sum, or indeed this sum, does not have Gaussian behavior. It's not close to being Gaussian. The tails are completely different. So if you think of it as being Gaussian, you're making a big mistake. That, that's not the situation. But uh, if you do a lot of conditioning, if you freeze and you kind of extract out to the outside all the randomness coming from these bits, then there is a little bit of behavior left, which is like Gaussian behavior additional Gaussian behavior. Uh, and actually you can make this precise using a, a multivariate form of the central limit. So um, if you have some probabilistic background, I hope that makes sense to you. If you don't, it might not make very much sense, but just think that there's some procedure that you can do that makes these things look a bit Gaussian in behavior. And that allows us to make some connection with the presentation I gave before from, from the classical. So now to understand this, we need to compute the means and the variances and the covariances, just like before, but now they're the conditional means and the conditional variances and the conditional covariances. Um, the means though are still very easy. So, so whatever these things are that we've uh, frozen, uh, conditioned on, the F of P's are independent and they have mean zero. So the conditional means are still always zero. So, so this is easy. So how about the variances and the covariances? Well, uh, the variance calculation, the conditional variance calculation is very similar to one I already did in my, in my previous work where I showed uh, this bound. So uh, I won't say very much about that. It turns out that the conditional variance here is uh, roughly like this kind of integral where F is the Euler product. So F of S is the product over all the primes up to capital uh, X of one minus F of P over P to the S to the minus one, I'd say it's the random order product corresponding to capital N. And you can show that with probability tending to one, these uh, integrals will be uh, greater than greater than roughly one over root log, log X, one over V of X squared root log, log X, where V is this function that's slowly tending to infinity. Um, so let me say here, um, if you want a probability that tends to one, which we do so that we can apply the first real Cantari lemma, then you need this V of X here. If you just had a lower bound like one over root log of X, you couldn't say this happened with probability tending to one. So you need to make the bound a bit smaller by this V of X factor to have this going to one. Um, also, so, so this is a bound for the, uh, the variance. So if you take the square root, then this becomes a bound for the standard deviation. If you take the square root of this, you get something roughly like one over log log X to the one quarter. Okay, and that explains the one over log log x to the one quarter here. So the reason that this usually has size one over log log x to the one quarter is because conditionally, the standard deviation is roughly like one over log log x to the one quarter. And um, for the, the expert bit of the audience, if there are any such people who know a bit more about this, uh, this is coming from the, the multiplicative chaos connection that exists in this problem, this one over root log log x factor. Um, so what I want to say a bit more about is the uh, covariance calculation, which is the, the kind of new thing in this problem. So it turns out that the uh, conditional covariance is the same kind of integral, very roughly speaking, but with this factor x over y to the minus it. 
if you look at the covariance for the sums up to x and over y. So if x is equal to y, this is just one, and you get the same integral as up there, like you'd expect. And if x and y are very close, then this will be close to one, and this one to the minus it, this thing close to one to the minus it won't change very much over this whole range of integration. So this will still be pretty close to that, as you'd expect, if x and y are close together, so the sums are very highly connected. But if x and y get further apart, then this will start to oscillate over this range of integration. You could hope for some cancellation from this factor. And you can show, and I'll say a few, few words about this, this is going to be the more technical bit of the talk, that uh, with probability tending to one over all the realizations of this Euler product, uh, this will be a lot smaller than this uh, band we have for the variance uh, for a lot of pairs x and y. So that says that for a lot of pairs x and y, the conditional covariance is a lot smaller than the conditional variance, so they're behaving like um, conditionally independent actions. And that's enough, just like in the classical LIL, to get the, the lower bounds out from maximum. So I want to explain um, roughly how you treat this, a little bit of how you treat this. Um, so I'll talk for about five minutes about this. This will be more technical, I think. Uh, and then I'll, I'll finish with a few remarks, which should be more accessible, maybe. Um, OK, so I want to restrict to looking at points x and y that look like um, capital X to the power 8 sevenths, so just this end point, multiplied by uh, e to the power 2 pi r, where r is some integer. So this is very like the situation I had before, where I have my powers of lambda. Basically, I'm taking lambda to be uh, e to the power 2 pi. And uh, I need to fit all these points into this interval so I can take r up to some constant multiple of log x and still have all these points in this interval. Um, so then if you look at, if you look at these uh, integrals for this choice of points x and y, then the, the capital X, the 8 sevenths cancel, and you just get here uh, e to the 2 pi, uh, some integer to the minus i t. So you get an expression uh, like this. And uh, if you want to know that for a lot of um, integers r, this uh, thing can't be too big, the standard number theoretic thing to do is you form a sum like this. So on the outside, I sum over all the r. Then I take some power of this, uh, this integral, the 2k power. I want to show this is a lot smaller than it would be if all of these uh, integrals were uh, this big. OK, so I want to get some band for this that's a lot smaller than than uh, this thing to the power 2k times uh, log x, the number of r bands. And a uh, technical point, but an important point here is that to make this work, we're going to have to take k uh, big. k is going to have to grow with capital X. Actually, k will end up being something roughly like log log x in size. And the reason for that is that it's quite well understood in these kind of arguments that to get a good bound, you need some kind of balance between the size of the, the thing that you're taking the power of and the number of terms in the outer side. And the number of terms here is roughly like log x. And we want to show that it's really a small proportion where this could be bad. It's a very small proportion of those log x terms where this could be big. And by a small proportion, I mean uh, some power of log x smaller than the first power. So we want it to be really almost all the r values where we have a good bound. So to do that, we need the, the kind of size estimates, rough size estimate we have for this to the power 2k to be sort of matching the number of terms in this outer sum, matching with the log x terms here. And the rough kind of size of this is going to be like 1 over some power of log log. So we need to take k big enough that 1 over some power of log log to the power k sort of uh, roughly compensates for the number of terms in the outer sum. And that's where this choice of k comes from. So as I, as I warned you at the start, this is the more technical bit, but maybe if you do know about this kind of arguments, that makes some sense to you. Um, so in particular, taking k to be one or two or something certainly will not suffice to get enough uh, good values of r. Um, OK, so if you believe me about that, then uh, once you have something like this, the obvious thing to do is to just expand the 2k power and then move the sum over r inside and try and perform the, the summation. Um, so if you do that, you'll end up summing up things like this, uh, e to the 2 pi i r, 
and then uh, summon some difference of the TIs, which come from expanding out the, the 2k power of this. And uh, this was the reason for putting the 2 pi there, so that this is a kind of nice sum for which we have some easy bands. So you get a band like this. It's at most the minimum of uh, the number of terms, which is roughly log x, or something that depends on the distance from this thing in the bracket to the nearest integer. So uh, if this thing isn't very close to an integer, so if this distance to the nearest integer is at least one over log x to the power two thirds, let's say, then we get a bound here, which will be at most log x to the power two thirds. If you just plug this, this lower bound in there, and that's very good. That's a saving by uh, a power of log x. Um, and what you might think now is, well, the, the part of the region of integration where this doesn't hold, so where this is smaller than one over log to the two thirds x, that's a very little piece of the, the whole range of integration. So we might expect that that should give a very little contribution. Um, but that's not true. So um, it turns out it does give a small contribution, and that's why the argument works, but it doesn't give a very small contribution. And the reason for that is that there are quite big contributions to these kind of integrals, even from very small intervals of t. So we expect there usually to be points t, where this the product has size roughly log x, very roughly speaking. So the square of it will have size like log squared x. And if you look on a little t interval around there of length one of log x, you get a contribution like log, uh, which will cancel with this one over log and give you quite a substantial piece of this whole integral. So there are very little bits of these integrals that contribute quite a lot, not everything, but quite a lot. So that says that successfully handling the complementary bit will be quite delicate. It's not just a question of saying the complementary bit is just a little piece of the whole integral, so it must contribute just a small proportion of the whole integral. That's not the case. Um, okay, so let me very quickly say something about how you do this, and then I'll go on to my closing remarks. Um, so what you want to do is to impose uh, in the integral some constraints on the size, not just of the the whole order product, but also of the partial order products. So of the partial products over the primes on certain ranges. So I won't really get into this because I think it's too technical, but for anybody who really knows about this, just note that the, the band we're imposing here has this factor log log x to the 1000 in the normally. Oh, so this is quite big, this factor. So I'm imposing a more stringent condition on the growth of the partial products than you usually do in these kind of problems. Uh, but it turns out you can do this with an acceptable average contribution to the, the whole integral. And once you have these, these bounds on the, on the growth, then you just distinguish two cases. So if in your tuple T1 up to uh, T2K, uh, a lot of the points are quite close together, so let's say order K of them are quite close together, then you use these bounds and you get a big saving for these uh, one over log log x to 1,000 savings. You get a saving like this to the power k, roughly. You get a saving like this for all of the points that are very close together. Uh, and that's a, that's a big win, so that's enough. Uh, if these points aren't all very close together, then, um, so we sort of know that if the points are well spaced, then you have some kind of rough independence between the order products. So then you can perform expectation calculations reasonably successfully, and then you can employ this condition and get a big saving. So I definitely don't expect anybody who doesn't already know about this to really follow what was on the last slide, but that's, that's for the experts. If anybody does have questions, I'm happy to answer them um, at the end. So let me finish with something sort of gentler with some closing remarks. So I said a long time ago that um, maybe this exponent one quarter in the theorem is sharp. Um, why is that? Well, in the classical, all the iterated logarithm, you get a bound like root x times square root log log x, roughly. And that's because at a single point x, the typical size of the sums is like root x, like the standard deviation of a Gaussian. And then looking at the limb soot increases that by this factor root log log x. Now, similarly here, the typical size of the point is roughly root x divided by log log x to one quarter. That's the result I, I mentioned that I proved a few years ago. And again, the band we have for the large fluctuations is this multiplied by root log log x. So it's root x times log log x to the one quarter. 
So the band we have for the large fluctuations in the random alternative case is like the one in the classical law reiterated algorithm, just adjusted for this difference in the typical results. So that's some reason to think this might be roughly sharp. Uh, it's far from certain for various, but if I had to bet a small amount of money, I might say what it is. Um, okay, now let me finish with something that doesn't have any randomness in it, in case you don't like randomness and haven't left already. Um, so a number theoretic analog of the problem I've been talking about, I said uh, a while ago that I don't think these random multiplicity functions really are such a good model for the Mobius function, uh, even though that's what they were originally introduced for. But what they are a good model for, I would say, is for Dirichlet characters, a randomly chosen Dirichlet character is well modeled by a, a Steinhaus random multiplicity function. So understanding the behavior of the maximum of the sum of f of n of a root x with high probability, that's kind of like asking for the behavior of the maximum of the character sum for most Dirichlet characters. So asking for something with high probability is like asking for something to hold for 99% uh, or asymptotically 100% of Dirichlet characters. So the analog of theorem one would be asking how this maximum behaves for most Dirichlet characters. And what I would expect is that if capital X isn't uh, too big compared with the conductor R, so for example, if capital X at most R to the three quarters, so that capital X the four thirds is at most R, then I would expect this to be well modeled by the, the random problem by theorem one. So I expect that for most characters, mod R, this maximum should be bigger than about log log x to the one quarter. And um, so the questions are, uh, what can you prove rigorously in the direction of this? And also what happens for larger capital X? So when capital X gets uh, closer to R, this can't continue to hold. There are lots of reasons for, for knowing that. Uh, so there should be transit, some transition that happens when capital X gets close to R. So the question is, what is this transition? And uh, this question, so, so a, lot of, a lot is known, a lot of work has been done on uh, large values of character sums, but almost all of this work is about what happens for kind of peculiar characters. So can you construct weird characters that make the character sum unusually big by kind of finding characters that behave strangely on the small primes? Say. And what I'm asking here is a different question. So I, I don't want these to be weird characters, some special subset of the characters. I want to know that for most characters, so for a typical character, you can get large values just by moving the endpoint of the range of summation about. So, so far as I know, essentially nothing non trivial is known about this problem. Um, so I would conjecture that this should be the answer on this range of capital X at least. And um, if anybody could prove anything as strong as this, that would be great. But proving anything on trivial, I think, would be something that's not known. Uh, um, okay, that's all I want to say. I think that's time. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much.